Ben Wattenberg. As the issue of race becomes ever more prominent in America's public dialogue, a controversial new book, The End of Racism, Principles for a Multiracial Society, promises to ignite a heated argument, very heated. Joining us to sort through that argument are, in the hot seat, the author of the book, Dinesh D'Souza, research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Glenn Lowry, a university professor at Boston University and author of One by One from the Inside Out, Essays and Reviews on Race and Responsibility in America. Christopher Edley, professor of law at Harvard University and former head of President Clinton's Task Force on Affirmative Action. And Michael Cromerty of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. The topic before this house, The End of Racism, Part One, this week on Think Tank. One of our panelists on this program, Glenn Lowry, had this to say about Dinesh D'Souza's book. Mr. D'Souza is determined to place poor urban blacks outside the orbit of American civilization. Their lives are governed by barbarism. They are the enemy within. It is no wonder that Dinesh D'Souza's book provokes comments like that when you consider the following sentence from page 22 of the book, quotes, Virtually all the contemporary liberal assumptions about the origin of racism, its historical significance, its contemporary effects, and what to do about it are wrong. Here are some of the arguments from the end of racism. Racism is a historically recent and Western idea. America is not racist, but it used to be. Today, the biggest problem with the black community isn't white racism, but black culture. Racial discrimination can be rational. And the conclusion that Dinesh D'Souza reaches is that in order to set up a truly fair, multiracial society, all race-based government policies must be scrapped, including affirmative action, but private individuals should be free to discriminate. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza, uh, you have to get used to 30 second sound bites. Let us hear the thesis of this book from you first. Its basic argument is that the bell curve is wrong to say that black failure in America is the result of genes. That's, and Char Charles, Murray's that's Charles Murray's book, book The Bell right. Curve. And the liberals are wrong to say that black failure in America can be wholly or even largely today attributed to racial discrimination. I argue not that, that we have uh, barbarians in our midst, but I argue we have seen a cultural breakdown in our society, uh, one whose effects are particularly bitterly felt among poor blacks, and that this is the main obstacle to success in America today. I'm a first generation immigrant, I've benefited from the civil rights movement, and I believe in a multiracial society we have to have equal uh, rules, fair rules, that apply equally to all citizens. It's that that we've gotten away from, and that we need to pay attention to. Okay, uh, Glenn Lowry, I know, I, I, I read a, uh, a draft of a review that you wrote and I, of, of Dinesh's book, and I could only, if I had to describe it in one word, I would say angry. Is that about right? Well, sure, the book did make me angry. And, uh, one of the reasons it makes me angry is that it is uh, insensitive. Now, that's a word that's in uh, bad repute these days because of the political correctness movement, which has made it difficult to talk candidly about issues that we must talk about. Dinesh is talking about something that we must talk about. But I insist that the way in which he does it, this is not my only point, but it's an important one, uh, is not helpful, is certain to provoke uh, to hurt, to anger, um, and to preclude the possibility of reasoned discussion. I see no reason to title a chapter on intelligence differences between blacks and whites the content of our chromosomes, or to include within it the statement that we can almost hear the roar of the white supremacist, quote, these people, forget about racism and discrimination, these people are naturally stupid, close quote. But Glenn, even, even where it's put in the mouth of a hypothetical racist, this is an inflammatory sentence. Okay, all right, let, let's hold up for, go ahead. Well, I, I only want to add this. I, I, I want to say that if D Dinesh had argued, as he claimed, 
that American civilization is in crisis and that we must p pay attention to that, a crisis of values, a crisis of culture, I would have been all with him because indeed that is the case. But that is not, in my reading of the book, what he argues. What he argues is that a certain cast of mind that he calls relativism prevents us from recognizing differences between cultures within America, like between black and white culture, prevents at least certain people from acknowledging the failings of black culture, and as a result, leads to a lack of civilizational capacities among people in the inner city, uh, which he then goes on to characterize, and again, in ways that I think uh, are um, imprudent and, right. and so on. Let's, let me just ask uh, Chris Edley and Michael Cromer if you have any brief general comment. Look, I, think, I think it's tough to come to terms with Dinesh's book. Uh, for me, I found several things in it, several lines of argument, several observations that resonated quite comfortably, but I found a host of others that did not. The tone that Glenn is discussing is clearly a problem and will be a difficulty as America tries to absorb the, the thrust of the arguments. But as to the substance, I think if I were going to say one thing about the book, it would be that there is frequently resort to what strikes me as a straw man kind of an argument. As though, for example, in the issue of cultural relativism, uh, that that is the core of all support for affirmative action and related social measures, when in fact cultural relativism in the extreme form that Dinesh lays out seems to me to be a very, uh, seems to me a view that's held by relatively few people. Uh, who cultural are relativism of basically being that the notion all, that all somehow cultures we are, are equal is no, no distinction. Right, and that we are somehow disabled from making judgments about what is good and what is bad, uh, what okay. is beneficial, what is, what is, uh, what is not. Right, Michael, brief comment, and then let's... Well, I think it's a very important, Ben, that we listen carefully to the way people read the book, uh, especially African Americans, as opposed to other people, the way they read the book. I read the book to say that there's, there are social pathologies in our culture, and especially in black culture, that are inhibiting black uh, progress. And uh, throughout the book, uh, Dinesh makes the point, unless there's renewal in this community, in that moral cultural arena, then we're in for big trouble, which we already are in. I, a lot of what I saw in Dinesh's book, in fact, is reflected in Glenn's newest book, One by One from the Inside Out, uh, where Glenn talks about the moral quandary of the black community. I, I was a little surprised by, by Glenn's uh, uh, critique of the book, but I'm, I'm also sensitive to the fact that he's right about some of the chapter titles I think are a little bit too provocative. All right, um, let's go to this list of, um, of, of ideas that Dinesh puts forward in the end of racism. Uh, the first one is racism is a historically recent Western idea. I, I distinguish between racism and, and, and what I call ethnocentrism or tribalism. You find groups fighting with each other all the time from the dawn of human history but it stretches the definition of racism beyond all comprehension to call the argument between the Hindus and the Muslims or the argument between the Serbs and the Croatians, these are people, by the way, of the same race, to call that racist. So I, I, I trace racism as a modern Western ideology that developed to explain a large civilizational gap between the West and other cultures. Racism became a commonsensical view to explain why the West had the, the Cathedral uh, of Chartres and the Cathedral of Notre Dame, the, the telescope and the microscope had mapped the planets and the globe. Other cultures, by comparison, appeared to be hopelessly primitive, hopelessly far behind. Racism to Europeans and, and by, uh, appeared to be a, a, a commonsensical way to account for these developments and, and that could not be explained by climate. And, and it's new. It's I modern. Mean, it, it began it, it, around modern. the 15th century okay. and, and, and reached its heyday around the 19th century. Okay. I think that's a plausible story. Uh, it's not new, of course. I mean, uh, the scholars okay. who have investigated these questions have made that point. Um, I just... Uh, what do you make of it? Would, right. would, it's the question is the implication and right. also the, uh, the following observation, which is that uh, uh, in Dinesh's account, and I think plausibly, this idea of racism develops in conjunction with enlightenment. It's, it's closely linked with the effort of Western man to understand natural phenomena. And given the moral uh, problems with the idea, as well as the subsequent discovery of many of the errors of people about these uh, notions, we can see the, some problematic aspects of the Enlightenment itself, as contrasted, for example, with uh, um, a more religiously grounded uh, ethical sensibility which would incline us to see people of different uh, ethnic origins uh, or I, racial is origins it, is it as equals. Recent, is it a recent development or are human beings 
inherently racist. I think that that's the key point you were you were. Well, I was saying that if right. racism has a beginning, it can have an it end. It can have an end, right. and that's okay. the reason for exploring the question. Right. It it. it I think that uh, I prefer to hope that it can have an end, uh, but uh, I, I think it's important uh, less to debate the historical origins and which particular which particular. Uh, century uh, mm -hmm. was the dawn of, uh, of this human tragedy uh, than to understand what are its contemporary uh, manifestations and effects and how do we get how do we get out of it. Uh, Dinesh says America is not racist but it used to be. Or Dinesh again give us a short paragraph on that and then Chris maybe you can well, with. racism is a, is a doctrine of uh, biological inferiority usually accompanied by the practice of systematized discrimination. Uh, and it is true that the vast majority of, Amer of Americans um, believed uh, uh, in black inferiority and supported a set of social policies. Believed in the past. Believed in the past. Today, there's very strong evidence, not just from, from opinion surveys, because people can lie, but, but, but uh, look, even looking at discrimination, which was the norm in America not very long ago, there's been a revolution not only in attitudes but in practice. Uh, and young people today are born after the civil rights movement. They take for granted the idea of equality. They can't imagine putting someone in the back of the bus. Uh, what concerns me is that these young people uh, are being uh, corrupted by into thinking of themselves in racial terms. Right. So the, the possibilities of the future are being, are being diminished. Chris Edley. The problem, with, the problem with the argument is that it fails to come to grips with a huge gulf in social perception. Uh, between certainly between blacks and whites and perhaps between whites and other disadvantaged minorities more generally. Uh, I mean whether one looks at the O.J. Simpson trial or whether one looks at a variety of phenomena that phenomena that Dinesh lumped under the category of statistical discrimination, the social experience that many African Americans feel is one of otherness with a bite. Not simply otherness in the sense that uh, Episcopalians are different from Methodists, but others with a bite that has lasting and important social and economic consequences. So I, I, it's difficult for me to see how we get to the bottom of this issue. Dinesh will say the problems are far more muted than they have been in the past. I would certainly concede that America is better now as a result of civil rights progress over the last couple of decades. Uh, the question is, how serious are the lingering effects and what set of subtle attitudes and habits of thought, habits of institutional behavior, uh, continue to, to stall progress? Michael, are, are we still racist in America? Well, there are certainly still racist in American society, and, and lots of them. Uh, but what I, I, I wanted to follow up on what Chris was saying, uh, I, I see Dinesh saying that racism still exists in this book. What I, I don't, what I don't, what I do hear him saying is that, however, it can no longer be an excuse for many of the problems in the African American community, and that we have to get over uh, this idea that uh, black people are putty in the hands of white people and cannot make their own decisions and cannot make their have their own lives. A lot of the problems that Dinesh described in this book do not have political and legal solutions. They are really moral, cultural problems that cannot be addressed by. Uh, legislation and I think that's going to create a lot of frustration for people because they'll want a political solution to a problem that's really moral and cultural. Let me just observe here if I may that uh, I agree with Dinesh on this point very strongly and have myself been arguing for many years uh, with respect to what should blacks do about our problems just this point discrimination racism civil rights activity petitioning to whites change the government policy will not solve the problems, won't make the crime rate go down, won't make the out of wedlock birth rate go down, won't make the um, failure to understand what the possibilities are implicit in contemporary America go away. Those are problems that have to be confronted directly by right. blacks. I think he's right about that. I do think, however, though, that racism is a historical f and cultural phenomenon in American society, which, because it's not being manifest at a given point in time by a set of people, does not mean that it won't come back can't creep in, can't influence the way in which we relate to each other. As we get more openly candid with each other, the risk is that we may provoke uh, a, a, a re-ignition uh, of a set of historic problems in American society. Do you think society. Dinesh's book could play a role in reigniting that? I would not accuse Dinesh or his publishers of you know, bringing down uh, racial comedy in America. That would be, oh, uh, on, an, ex that would be an extreme <laughs> thing. But, but I think there's a problem. I think, you know, Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein in the bell curve, they go out so far. 
Dinesh goes out a little bit further in some of his inflammatory rhetoric. The issue here is a flaunting of convention. It's a kind of, um, the credibility comes from the bravery to say what others will not have said before. I, I'm defined to be making a contribution purely by virtue of not attending to the sensibilities of others. I think that's, that's well, a the, pernicious the you, development. The way you first phrased it uh, is something that is honored in the intellectual community, in theory, which is to have the guts to say something that people know is no, so, but let don't me want to say. What's honored in the media is controversy and iconoclasm. What's honored in academia is creativity. And uh, if, I can go, if I can go back to another one, I, I think that there is a flaw in much of this discussion. I think we put too much weight on the word racist. What is racist? What is not racist? What is the definition of racism? Uh, that's the wrong debate. And uh, uh, if, if Dinesh's straw man is a small slice of, uh, of, of public opinion or opinion on the left, that wants to paint a broad brush and say that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that racism uh, exists around every corner, that's fine. What I am more concerned with is, whether you call it racist or not, the deep and pervasive pattern of, let's call it, malign indifference. A malign indifference to the welfare, the aspirations, the problems, the <coughs> challenges faced by people who are different from you. Uh, who live in another community I, that you feel free to ignore. I, that brings us right to the, to the next point, and I know you want to deal with that. And, and that point was, uh, as we phrased it in the setup, he's the biggest problem with the black community isn't white racism, but black culture. So why don't you... Even though the problems of American civilization stretch across the, the national culture, there are some problems that are distinctive to black culture. A good example for this is the extremely high, virtually parasitic reliance of African Americans on the government. Now, I point out in the book that there is every historical reason for this. Historically, while many whites have viewed the government as the enemy of rights, the, the Bill of Rights says Congress shall not do this, Congress shall not do that. Blacks have found the government to be a helper. The government ended slavery. The federal government ended state segregation. The federal government was the employer of last resort, helped a lot of blacks make, enter the transmission belt of the middle class. So I'm not saying that it's peculiar or bizarre that blacks rely on the government, but I'm saying today, when the government cannot employ large numbers of people, when public confidence in the government is low, the Korean or the Asian strategy of entrepreneurship, of small business, which is very weak in the black community, we need to stress that. So a cultural orientation that was functional at one time is dysfunctional white today. Racism. White racism, if white racism were to end overnight, this would not improve black test scores. Uh, it would not increase black savings rates, black rates of business formation. It would not reduce violence in, in the inner city. It would not strengthen black families. Well, I think that goes, that's obvious. It would, be well, it would be a start. Well, of course he's right. Of course what he's saying is right. Well, and as written, I say, people have been saying that, this for a very long time. Right. But look, um, parasitic, parasitic black dependence on government transfers is parasitic. Okay, let's suppose Dinesh doesn't know what he's saying. Let's say he has a tin <laughs> ear. What about Joe Sixpack? Okay, in Idaho, in Arkansas, what does he think about the parasitic, blood-sucking blacks? The point here is this. Well, Glenn, you're, if you're, I may, you're going If I, if I may here. just make the point. Oh. The, Dinesh makes the following argument in his book. He says, there were certain personality types under slavery. The, the, sam, the sambo, the dependable mammy, the sullen uh, field hand, the inscrutable trickster. We can still find some of those types today, he says. Some of those types are still to be observed today. Which one, one wants to know? The, the a comparable sentence about Jews, there were certain personality types to be observed in the Russian shtetl. Okay, you can complete the sentence. We can still find some on Wall Street today. The reason that no one utters that sentence in polite company is because six million people were exterminated by a regime which uttered those sentences for 15 years. The failure to appreciate the importance of this point that I'm making here is part of what makes Dinesh D'Souza's book considerably less than what it could be. Now let me just make Glenn, one other it, point. Is it racist, Glenn? What, who cares? I don't, you know. I, 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 what, what was your question? Is, is the book racist? Is, 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 is that racist? insensitivity book, racist? I don't want to put a label on it. I want to say exactly what I said. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to our republic. It's dangerous I to the it. organic and constructive dialogue that we must have if we're going to get beyond this problem. And I want to just make one other point briefly, and that's this. American civilization is in trouble. In the 1950s, there were a bunch of people who, re who rebelled against the organization man in conformity, and they wrote a bunch of books. In the 1960s, that developed into a kind of counterculture of drugs, free sex, and so forth. 
we have a corporate culture that uh, markets uh, destructive rap music, as Bill Bennett is trying to get everybody to know. We have a demand for cocaine in this country that's through the roof, and I assure you it's not all being consumed by people in the inner city, et cetera, et cetera. We've got out of work birth like rates that are going through the roof. This is a problem for American civilization. This is a problem which will only be solved if we reconstruct the way in which we think about America. Uh, so the I division agree. between I black agree. and white and the link of this to black culture is when spoken from inside the black community, a plausible set of arguments about self-help and reconstruction. When spoken from outside the black community, can become a very destructive set of, uh, well, of arguments this about is the that heart are divisive of it, and, See, and sense, uh, so on. The heart of the issue is that I suppose, I suppose I have broken the code, which is that only people like Glenn Lowry and Christopher Edley get to talk about this in their living room. I am, in a sense, viewed as an outsider. Maybe I haven't suffered enough. I am not criticizing black now. culture, pure and simple. I, I point out in the book, I cite the urban anthropologist Elijah Anderson, who says, I think vividly and accurately, that there are two cultures in the inner city what he calls the besieged culture of decency, people who struggle to maintain, keep their families together, keep steady jobs, and what he calls a hegemonic, a dominant culture of incivility, of violence, of sex abuse. Now, I can use all the euphemisms in the world, but that's what it is. Now, what the problem is we have to have the courage as a society to say one culture is better than the other. And we need to stand up for those civilizational values. Look, I believe the line between civilization and barbarism runs through every human heart. I don't believe it runs between blacks and whites. And I think that we can make a, disting a distinction uh, between those civilizational forces in the black community that need to be strengthened. I say all this, but you don't seem to hear it. I didn't, well, I didn't hear the line between civilization and barbarism on, runs through the human heart, Chris, not between races, because it's not in your book. Chris Edley uh, asked playing the role of moderator, asked uh, Glenn Lowry whether he thought Dinesh's book was racist. Uh, let me ask you, do you think Dinesh's book is racist? I think that, I, I mean, candidly, I think that uh, I want to resist getting into that argument. I think that's a different, I think that's a different topic. I think Why what Glenn is, no, here's that? the, but, but here's, but he, because <laughs> here's a, the problem. If the right. issue is what is racism, right. if the issue is what is racism, I think that that's a diversion. I think the question is, what's the set of attitudes that are pathological in America? Mm -hmm. To me, the attitude that is pathological is the one that says, I'm not worried about the problem that exists <coughs> in the underclass, because I've got mine, and to hell with the rest of them, as long as they don't become a big drain on, on my affairs, on my budget, on my community, on my sense of security, on my economic aspirations. Now, in my view, that pathological, malign indifference to the welfare of others is tinged with the problem of color, with America's particular neuroses about color. Okay. The fact that they are dark means that white America is even less likely to include them in some sense of community and some sense of shared aspirations and values. Uh, and I, now, I view in, in, my own, in my own lexicon, that's racism. That's the problem. L let me just say, Ben, that, uh, let me answer your question that Chris didn't answer. It's not a racist book. It's a very serious, courageous book in this sense. Uh, that it, it says that if not certain cultures are different, certain behaviors must be condemned among white people and among black people. Certain behavioral patterns in the black community are not going well. And the fact that we have so many children without fathers, so many children who don't even know what a father is, is a crisis of immense proportion, and the violent crime rate uh, is skyrocketing. I think maybe if Dinesh had emphasized certain behaviors and not just say it was peculiar to the black community, he would have been better off and the language would have been a little more sensitive. Well, of course, he does say that it's not peculiar to the I black community. That. Those qualifying sentences are there. But what he does not say is that this is a problem of American civilization running down through the heart of every human being, et cetera, et cetera. And indeed, he can't say it because the logic of the book, with its emphasis on cultural disparity, uh, the boogeyman is the relativist who refuses to acknowledge the cultural disparity, which Dines has the courage to look straight in the eye, forces him to make a distinction among Americans as between the disparate cultures. Okay, uh, we need to uh, break here. Please join us next week when we will continue the discussion of the end of racism. Uh, until then, uh, thank you, uh, Dinesh D'Souza, Glenn Lowry, Michael Cromarty, and Christopher Edley, and thank you. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 11507 17th Street Northwest, Suite 1050, Washington, D.C., 20036. We can be reached via email at thinktv at aol.com, and do check out our new homepage on the World Wide Web at www.
www.thinktank.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.